Okay, scripture reading is found in uh, Gospel according to Luke, chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, and uh, it's verses 1 to 14. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 14. And um, if it sounds familiar, we had some of it this morning, so that's, uh, that's it, but it's uh, uh, hopefully uh, helpful, and um, it certainly bears repeating. So Luke chapter 2, uh, verses 1 to 14, let's hear God's word. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, every one to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Well, before we come to the message... Uh, let's come to prayer. Let's, uh, let's bow our heads in prayer as we speak and come before Almighty God. Let's pray. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, thank you that tonight we can come in prayer. Thank you that as we come to you, we come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that you are a prayer hearing God, but you also are a prayer answering God. You answer the prayers of the saints. You answer the prayers of your children. But Father, thank you as well that you answer that cry for mercy. God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Thank you that you still answer that prayer uh, today. And we do pray, Lord, that in the course of this Christmas period, there will be men and women, boys and girls, who will cry out that prayer, who will ask for mercy, and that they will find that you are a God who is more willing to forgive than they are even to ask for forgiveness that you are a God who is more willing to give this gift of salvation than they are to even receive that gift. Our God and our Father, thank you that you are a God who answers prayer because you are a God who is mighty. You are a God who is almighty. You are a God who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. And so help us please, oh God, to expect more. Help us please to have that sense of anticipation that sense of uh, expectation. And Lord, we know we cannot whip that up, but we can, oh Lord, encourage one another and all the more as we see that day approaching. Thank you, oh Lord, for the fellowship of the saints. Thank you that we're able to share a meal. Uh, Many of us here were able to share a meal this afternoon in the church hall. Thank you, Lord, for the facilities to be able to do that. Thank you for the skills that you were given, the gifts that you were given to, to men and women within this church. And we do pray, Lord, that it would be a church where gifts are used and utilised. And so to that end, O Lord, we pray that each one of us would consider what gifts we have where we can serve you. Father, we thank you for the privilege of serving you. We thank you that we are saved in order to serve. And it's not a duty in so much as a chore. It's a delight 
It's a responsibility, yes, but it's a privilege and a, a superabounding privilege to be able to serve you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Thank you that you've chosen the weak things of this world to confound the wise. Thank you that we can be useful instruments in your hands. And uh, Lord, we pray that uh, even as was read uh, at the start of the uh, singing together, that uh, all the different instruments in the Old Testament, and uh, tonight we've had a keyboard and our voices as instruments, yet Lord, we can be instruments in service to you. And Lord, when we serve you with a glad heart, we make a joyful noise. We are, Lord, a good tribute to you and uh, a tuneful song to you, Lord. And we do pray that we would be thrilled with the reality of serving you. And yes, Lord, there are times when we are weary in the work, but we're not weary of it. There are times when we are tired. There are times when we are cast down. All the different situations, Lord. We think of our brother Paul, who went through all of that. And yet ultimately, Lord, uh, you are on the throne and you give grace and your grace is all sufficient. And uh, Lord, we think of our brothers and sisters, perhaps in other churches. Maybe there are many fellowships, perhaps, who aren't meeting tonight because... Uh, there aren't the numbers, that maybe, or, or there's that sense of, uh, of d being down because it's a day of small things. Oh God, please help them. Help us to have our eyes lifted to see that you are still on the throne, that you are mighty and mighty to, to, be sa to save, and that there is this glorious good news that is as relevant today as ever it has been. There is this glorious invitation to come to Jesus, and it is still an invitation that requires a response and it is still an invitation that is valid. It has not expired. There is still hope. There is still hope uh, in Jesus. And so, our God and our Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters uh, up and down this land and uh, indeed around this world. We pray especially for the persecuted church. We thank you, Lord, for the grace that you give them. Oh, God, what a testimony to see your grace at work in that place, in those uh, situations. And, Lord, we thank you that you are still building your church. Father, thank you that your son promised whilst he was on this earth, and we plead that promise, we hold him to that promise. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. And thank you that the kingdom of God is being built and that one day King Jesus will return. And we have this hope in our hearts, even tonight. We have this expectancy. We have this glorious uh, hope that Jesus is coming again. And so we thank you, Lord, that the best is yet to come. For the believer tonight, uh, the best is yet to come. But Lord, we are mindful that not all tonight may be believers. And so we pray, O oh Lord, that it would be impressed upon our hearts the reality that those who are on the broad road that leads to destruction dare not uh, breathe another breath without being right with you. The fragility of life, Lord, the, the vulnerability of life. But that those who are on that narrow way, they are on that narrow way that leads to eternal life. And yes, few there be that find it, but Lord... You are able to save, to save to the uttermost. A countless number, a number that no man can save, uh, no man can number. Uh, Lord, you alone can save, you alone can rescue. And so to you, we give you the praise tonight. We just give you all the glory and all the praise. Please help us, Lord, in this. Help us to sing our praises out to you. For you are worthy, worthy are you, O oh God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, worthy of praise tonight. And Lord, thank you that our tune will be to in, in heaven, worthy is the Lamb. And thank you that we are celebrating the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ at this time of year. And thank you, Lord, that uh, next week we'll be able to gather again. And we do pray, Lord, even this week uh, for, the, for the meetings and, and on Sunday uh, for, the, for the services and the Sunday at four for the carol service, we pray, oh God, that you would uh, presence yourself, you would own those meetings. And uh, just as we praise you for all that is past, we think of yesterday, we think of the home carol service of Chris and Liz's, uh, we think of the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, opportunities that our, our sis, uh, sister Jackie has had in, in the schools. Lord, as we praise you for all that is past, we trust you for all that is to come. And so this week, Lord, please continue with us and may we just again be lost in wonder, love and praise that you are so good and so kind and this message is indeed worthy of uh, shouting out about hallelujah what a savior we have what a friend we have in jesus in whose name we ask these things tonight amen amen, amen. okay amen good
Well, we continue our uh, uh, studies uh, in uh, uh, the, the songs, the Christmas songs, as, as, as we call them, uh, songs of praise. And um, we've looked at, so who have we, who, whose songs have we looked at? We've looked at um, Elizabeth's. And uh, remember, she was, uh, 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 it was a miracle that she had a, a baby because she was past child bearing age. Uh, but she, uh, she was uh, able to testify and she was able to bless and um, she was able to uh, humble herself and recognize God's hand upon her relative, Mary. And uh, then after that, Mary's song, the Magnificat, uh, the word uh, mag to magnify. That's where we get that word. And Mary was one then who magnified the Lord. And uh, she was humble. She, she, why, why, why is she so favored? And uh, the Christian can say that. Why am I so favored? Why, O oh Lord, such love to me? And then... Uh, uh, we saw uh, last week Zachariah's song, uh, Zachariah, the father of John the Baptist, just as this baby has been born, you would uh, miss, uh, be uh, forgiven for thinking that he would be just full of, uh, uh, full of it because uh, his, his lad's just been born, he'd be singing about his lad. Uh, well, he was full of it in terms of that God had blessed him abundantly and that God was re uh, um, bringing to fruition this plan of redemption and that his son was going to be a cog in the wheel, a forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. And his son was going to be saying, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And uh, we've seen that there are similarities in these songs and there are differences. And we've sought to apply it each week, uh, broadly speaking, to those words that we find in uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And uh, chapter 5, verse 18, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And we've seen that our experiences as Christians, we have a testimony. We have a, 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 a reality in our lives that God, by his Holy Spirit, lives in our lives and we can testify to it. And there's an authenticity to our testimony. We don't need to be like double glazing salesmen. We don't need to try and just present it in such a way. We have nothing to hide. And the more people we inspect our lives, yes, they'll see that we fail, but that the one who is enabling us, he never fails. He is faithful. He cannot deny himself. And we will see that we'll be able to sing of our experiences the experiences of what God is doing in our lives even now. And we'll be able to be benefited from other people's songs, from other people's testimonies. And when we see someone being uh, w uh, uh, used by the Lord or when being dealt with by the Lord, we're able to praise God and uh, the corporate element you see. And so tonight I want us to look at uh, this, uh, the angels' song. And, and really it's, it's the heavenly host's song. It's the song of the heavenly host. Uh, because uh, with the account of the shepherds, you have the first angel come onto the scene. And one commentator says, God was kind here. Because if the heavenly host had come on, the shepherds would probably have collapsed. All of them at once. So you have the, heaven, the, the angel first uh, with this message. And uh, we heard, didn't we, this morning, it's the gospel message. That finally Messiah has come. That finally a saviour has been born. The one to whom all, since Adam and Eve, have been waiting for. Generation, generation after generation after generation. And finally, he's here. And he, uh, uh, the angel, shares it with these shepherds. Remember those outcasts? Uh, the privilege of being shared to, uh, being spoken to by the angel. But then, you have, after the, the first angel has given his message and told them that he's to be, uh, Jesus is to be found, uh, in, a, in a manger, wrapped in swaddling cloths. You then have this kind of, um, this heavenly host, just as it were, appearing out of the blue. Uh, because in verse 13 it says, of Luke chapter 2, suddenly, and uh, it's the suddenness of it, a great company, a multitude of the heavenly host. And uh, we're not told um, what they looked like, we, we know, don't we, that these were mighty creatures, angels, because oftentimes people were fearful in their presence. And we know in the Old Testament there were cherubims and seraphims. 
Uh, and we know that they're, they're different creatures with, uh, because of, of different names. We know of Michael, we know of Gabriel, so on and so forth. But what we're described here is this heavenly host. And uh, I, I was thinking about this because there's, there's, a, there's, a, um, there's a sense of, a, of an army, the Lord's army arrayed. And, um, you know, have you ever seen on films maybe those epics where an army is lined up and perhaps you have the cavalry and the sun shining on the helmets. Perhaps you have the banners flapping in the breeze. Perhaps you have the bowmen with the, the arrow, arrows at the ready. Maybe you have uh, the foot soldiers, perhaps with the swords drawn or the spears there or their shields ready. And you have, perhaps as far as the eye can see, division after division, battalion after battalion, company after company, uh, regiment after regiment of the, this army. And what a grand sight it is. Well, you see, it's not too dissimilar here because this is this heavenly host and we know that there are lots of angels because Jesus himself said when he was on this earth, do you not think that I could draw even this, at this time on 12 legions of angels? So numbers aren't a problem. You know, this, the sky being filled, how many were there? We're not told, we're told it was a great company. So the sky is filled by this heavenly host and this multitude Perhaps looking in, perhaps wearing different things, perhaps with banners. We're not told. The point is, though, that there is this heavenly host, this army, God's messengers, those who dwell with God. Remember, Gabriel said, Behold, I am Gabriel, and I stand in the presence of God. None of us could stand in God's presence because we would be, no man can stand uh, before God and live because our God is a consuming fire. Yet these angels were able to stand in God's presence. And here they are, they burst onto the scene. After the, the one angel has given his message, they burst onto the scene and they have this song. And it's a short song, isn't it? It's a short song, but they're, uh, they're singing it. And uh, they're, they're, they're shouting it, they're singing it, we're not told. I know people have strong views that, it, well, it's got to have been sung, fine. But the point is this, it was a song. It was, it was something from the heart, as it were. It had this message. There was a message to it, and it was thrilling. And uh, that's what we're going to consider. So that's the, the context, if you will. I'm just looking at my notes, checking I've got this week's. I think I have. Yes, there we are. A bit of a panic, but they are this week's, not next week's. Uh, last week, sorry. So we're, uh, we're on track. Now then, who is singing? So that's the context, uh, briefly, is that uh, the angel gives his message, the heavenly host come on the scene, and then the shepherds afterwards go. And in a sense, you see, clearly it was a, an amen to the message of the angel, wasn't it? You know, that's, that's what we can gain from this. It was this heavenly host just, as it were, saying amen to this message. And we'll come to more onto that message in a moment. But undoubtedly, it had an impact on the shepherds. Uh, and uh, you cannot take the message of the angel, the first angel, without the, the complimenting, if you will, without the follow-up of this heavenly host. Uh, saying there are men, if you will, uh, on, on the first message. So you have uh, there the context, and uh, straight at the outset, we can say, uh, I applied it uh, like this on, on Tuesday night at, at, uh, at the Taylor's house, uh, that, um, you know, tonight we're hearing a message from a preacher, um, and it's ultimately it's a message from God. We believe that God speaks through the preacher by his Holy Spirit, but that amongst us then, there is this corporate element, this amen, and the wonder of oftentimes after a message, after God has given his message, after the message has been given and it's been received, there's oftentimes that sense, the last song, the last hymn of a service is oftentimes very special because there is that opportunity for the congregation to say amen to what has been said and to what has been spoken. And there's this sense at which when you hear a message and you know that God has spoken, you want to respond and the Christian wants to sing. The Christian wants to praise God. The Christian wants to say amen to what is being said. Because in their heart they know it's the truth. And in their heart God is being lifted up. And so, um, you know, the challenge then is when people come in and visit. And uh, we may have visitors amongst us this, this evening. That's great. Good to have you with us. Uh, but in addressing the church, I hope uh, visitors, as you see and listen to the singing afterwards, you will see a group of people who want to sing. You will see a group of people who believe in what they're singing. 
you will see a group of people who have a song to sing, have something to sing about. And uh, undoubtedly, when Christians are a witness in that way, it has a great effect on those looking on. And uh, the shepherds were greatly affected by these heavenly, this heavenly host, this great company of the heavenly host. Now, who is singing? And uh, that's the thing. Who, who is singing? Uh, what are they singing? And uh, why are they singing? So those are my three headings that will keep me on track, hopefully. Who is singing? Well, as we've looked at, this song is different to the other songs. This song is the angels singing. The other songs, it was people. Now, that, there's a great difference there. You know, uh, we're told in the Bible that when Satan fell, remember, God is creator. There's all, if, you had, if you had two piles and you put in one pile everything that's been created, uh, it'd be a big pile, wouldn't it? And then if you had in, a, in, a, in another setting uh, anything that's, that's not created, only God would inhabit that uh, group because God alone is uncreated. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, the second person of the Trinity. Uh, forever uh, begotten, not created. Uh, he's forever eternally generated from the Father. There's a mystery there. But the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. God, uncreated, has always been and always will be. And everything else, everything that you can possibly think of, is in this other group, created. Including uh, the apple of his eye, the, the icing on the cake. Mankind. Why? Because why are we so special in God's sight? Well, because we are made in his image. In other words, uh, Adam was able to have fellowship. You know, uh, the, the Psalms tell us that the animals look up and see from where their food comes from. Instinctively, they know that God provides for them. And yet elsewhere, we're told that the ostrich in the book of Job uh, forgets where it buries its eggs and stamps on them. So God hasn't given much intelligence to the bird brain ostrich but he has given some an intelligence to understand that they get their food from God. But no animal can have, a, uh, can have fellowship with God. We're different. We're not animals in that sense. We're human beings. There's something significant about us. We're above the creatures. That's why Adam was given the task of, um, uh, of stewardship over the creatures. We are made in God's image. That being so, because we have a soul. We have the um, Adam and Eve were able to fellowship, commune with God. They were able to glorify God. They were able to enjoy God. And God was able to commune and enjoy the worship and adoration of his creatures, of his children. And, uh, you know, sin came along. We know that, don't we? And wrecked that relationship. And this glorious gospel is the good news that there is a way, that God has found a way to bridge, to reconcile man to God so that we can have fellowship with God, so that we can worship God, so that we can come back into his presence. And it's only through Jesus. It's only through being washed by the blood of the Lamb. But the angels, you see, are different creatures altogether. But they are created and we're told that at, when Satan, who was one of the three archangels, when Satan rebelled against God and Satan looked at himself and God created him magnificently. What a magnificent creature the angel Lucifer was. But you know, Lucifer looked at himself and he considered that he wanted to take God's place. He wanted to usurp God's place. And that's not possible because God alone is God. God cannot share his glory. It's impossible. And so the only thing to be, what would ha could happen, is that Satan was cast out. Satan was cast out uh, after that rebellion against Almighty God. And we're told a third of the angels were cast out also. And we're told that they have been cast out. And one day there will be that full and final judgment. And we're told that for them, there is no hope whatsoever. There is no way of reconciliation for them. They are absolutely and utterly lost. And there is no opportunity for them to be reconciled to God. But the remaining two-thirds, they have continued. Since they were created, they have continued to worship God, 
They have continued to sing his praises. And now and again in the scriptures, we're given glimpses of it. And uh, just as at this point, we're given a glimpse of it. It's a wonderful glimpse. Because what we see is, we see a group of creatures who have always been with God. Since their creation, they've always been in God's presence. And you get a glimpse of the fact that they're bored by it? Not at all. These angels are positively popping. These angels are, 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 cannot wait to share their song. And yet their song is different to ours, in so much as they are looking on and seeing this plan of redemption working out. They are looking on and seeing sinful people being made children of God and grace being at work in them, and they are looking on and seeing them being made trophies of grace. But they themselves are not, are, are not participants, in a sense, of this redemption. They, they are not through personal experience singing about a redeemer saving them because they have never fallen. And so they are looking on. It's a, it's a different perspective, if you will. Uh, so in a sense, not better or worse. Maybe you take issue with that. Maybe you say, well, it's not as good as ours. Okay, fine. But the point is there's a different perspective here, different to what's gone on before. So it's angels who are singing, not people. And these angels are in a unique position because they have always been in God's presence and uh, the Old Testament points to the, the, the wonder of that. You know, our God is a consuming fire. Who can see God and live? And yet these angels have, uh, have been in the presence of God for all of their existence. And they not only live, they thrive. And they not only thrive, they are thrilled at being in the presence of God. And so that gives us a glimpse of just the, the wonder of being in God's presence, of, of being in God's company. Uh, these aren't angels that are bored and are uh, fed up. These are angels that are just absolutely thrilled and enthralled with what's going on. And another difference, uh, another uh, thought with this is that this is a very short song. And uh, we've shared, haven't we, over these last few weeks about, uh, you know, we're to speak to one another, psalms, hymns and spiritual songs. And uh, it's just lovely the fact that though this is short, we can say it's very, very sweet. Uh, it's not lacking in content. There's a powerfulness here to this song. And uh, I would just encourage, you know, uh, when we think of prayers, um, recently a brother said, well, I, I, I don't know what to pray. I don't feel I can pray. And uh, it was just the usual advice, the encouragement to you know, just pray one thing, pray something that's on your heart. Uh, give thanks to him, to God, for saving you. And so at uh, one of our last growth groups, our brother did. And uh, it was uh, a great encouragement to those that were there. And he had then, he was able to pray. So too, friends, with this song, if you will, this, this uh, testimony of worship, uh, this uh, petition of praise, each of us who are in Christ are able to sing to his praises. And in fact, God demands it. And uh, um, this, is, uh, this is another um, uh, difference, if you will, uh, to the others, is that this is a communal song or a corporate song. Uh, I like to think that they, just as you have uh, the different divisions of an army and the different uh, kind of uh, uh, types, infantry, cal uh, cavalry, all the rest of it, or tanks nowadays, that type of thing, uh, so too in a, in, a in a choir, this choir of angels, you have harmony, don't you? You have maybe the trebles, the, the altos, the basses, the tenors, uh, and there's this lovely harmony. Well, uh, I like to think of them having this, it was a harmonious, it certainly wasn't discordant, it was harmonious, but it also was in unison, in as much as they were absolutely one in their song. But it was a corporate song, it was communal. There was a myriad number of voices. It wasn't one person like Elizabeth or Mary or um, uh, Zachariah. It was a distinct, uh, massive number of, 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 of uh, uh, heavenly host creatures singing or speaking praise uh, of God. So there are differences then with the song, uh, the other songs, but clearly there are also similarities. Uh, so what are they singing? Well, glory to God in the highest, and uh, on earth peace to men on whom his favour rests, or, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. 
And we'll come on to the different the textual variant, variants in a moment. Uh, but let's look at the first line first. It's speaking of glory to God. And this is, this is the most important, friends. This has to come first. Why are we gathered here tonight? We're gathered here to worship God. Why has God even... The big question now, why has God come up with this plan of salvation? You know, he could have just left us be. When we rebelled against God, he doesn't need us. He's not a needy God. He, the Father, Son, and Spirit, have perfect communion with each other. There is an overflow of love towards one another. We aren't there to, to meet a need, so to speak. But God has chosen to demonstrate his glorious his, his vastness, his love, he's, he's, he's chosen to demonstrate just how God he is by making a way of reconciliation. And so, first and foremost in our lives is, that, is, is for us to give him the glory that is due to his name. You see, the chief end of man, we're told in the catechism, aren't we? The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's our chief purpose in this earth, is to bring glory to God. You see, we're bringing God glory tonight by gathering together to worship him. And you maybe listen to the voice of the evil one to say, well, what much use is that? You know, the football stadiums are fuller than this. It doesn't matter, friends. Uh, God is delighted. God is delighted to hear his children's praise tonight. And uh, it's our chief purpose it's our chief purpose to bring glory to God. And then the second uh, phrase, moving on, and on earth peace to men on whom his favour rests. Or, uh, as it says, on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Now the reason for the textual variation is simply one letter in the Greek, and it depends which manuscript you look at, but do you know it's, it's both or and. Uh, some commentators take a position and in terms of it's either one or the other. Uh, we're not going to get kind of caught up on that tonight. One is emphasizing the fact that um, uh, this message of goodwill, uh, those who hear it and respond, uh, they're the ones who find favor with God or uh, uh, it's, it's uh, favor on those whom it rests. The, the other variation is, is more that this is just this um, message that is, is for all and sundry, as it were. And it's this goodwill towards all mankind. Uh, and the both are true. You know, the reality is that for God so loved the world. The reality is that this Christmas message is for every person we come into contact with. That we are to be absolutely indiscriminate in publishing abroad the sinner's friend. That in this room I can say, hand on heart, this message is for you. And it doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you know. It doesn't matter what you think you know. It doesn't matter whatever your situation or your background or your culture or your gifts or whatever it will be. This message of good news that there is a saviour born for you, that there is a way of reconciliation, that there is a gift of salvation to be received this Christmas time is for each one of us. And yet the reality is, as we heard this morning, that it's not enough to just hear this good news. It's not enough just to hear it tonight. You know, it's not enough just to go from here saying, I've heard this good news. There must be a response to this message. There must be a response to hearing the good news. And we know, don't we, we heard it this morning, the shepherds responded. The shepherds responded to the good news and they went and found Jesus. And you too, friend, my friend, this, this evening, if you haven't responded to this good news, you must do. Because it will do you no good unless you respond. And so God's favour is on you when you respond. So respond. Is God's favour on me? Well, have you responded? You know? So this is also the point then. That glory to God in the highest and, you know, this... this Glory to God in the highest salvation points to the, the magnificence of God. What a God. Who would do this? What a God God is. That he would find a way of reconciliation for sinful man. Think of it. Us. We're not even these mighty creatures. 
We're these uh, little people, as it were. We're like drops in the ocean, nations in, are in a bucket, in, uh, like nations in a bucket in God's sight. God is so vast and massive. We're so small and itty bitty. And yet, God demonstrates his love toward us. And, while, and yet, while we were sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. So this glory, what glory this gives to God. The angels are looking on and going, glory to God in the highest. This plan of redemption is unfolding before our very eyes. They, they've seen, they've witnessed, they've been alive for all of the generations from Adam right now through to, uh, uh, to uh, John the Baptist and indeed Jesus himself being born onto this earth. They know that this baby is the Son of God incarnate. They know that he has left the glories of splendor. They know that this is the kind of, this is where the rubber hits the road in terms of the redemption unfolding of the plan. They know now that things are going to happen. We don't know how much they know, but we know that they know certain certain things and they're privy to certain things and they're witnessing through certain things they're looking on at certain things and they're just amazed and they're bubbling over saying glory to God in the highest but yes the consequences of this also is that mankind almost if we could put it in paraphrase mankind you do not realize how amazing this is for you guys we see what's going on in heaven you don't see it we're witnessing Almighty God and for all of our existence, which has been thousands of years, but we're in eternity, so it's like that. For all of our existence, we're seeing this Almighty God and we're just in wonder, love and praise. But now we're seeing something unfolding and we cannot contain ourselves. The whole company of the heavenly host have sneaked out from heaven to appear to these shepherds and to just to sing their song. Why? Because, listen, you've got to understand that this message, this, this gift of salvation to you, you are so privileged. Because there's a third of the angelic host who left. And they haven't got that. They've gone. You creatures. Insignificant creatures. Yet you are made in God's image. And he loves you. And we can see that he loves you. With this amazing, wonderful, infinite love. And this love is now being poured out. And is being shown and manifest. In the person of this little baby. That's being born. Listen up. What peace. What privilege. What provision for you, humanity. Yeah? So that's the angel's song. They're singing of God. But they're also singing to people to say, look, listen, this is just tremendous. This is almost beyond words. But these are the words that we're going to sing. Peace to men on whom his favour rests. Or peace, goodwill towards men. Listen up, the whole of earth. Listen up. And, you know, in a sense, we should hear that song tonight. Of course, the angels aren't singing it now. Uh, they've gone back. They're doing what they're doing. I don't know. But, uh, of course, that song is as valid today as ever. And if we could have them come, maybe you'd listen. But you know what? You don't need them because the shepherds knew that when the angels spoke to them, it was God who was speaking. And you should know that tonight, when God's word is being opened up, it's God speaking. And in your hearts, if you know that you're being spoken to, guess what? That's God speaking. And what is God saying? God is saying this. This thing of salvation, yes, it brings me glory. And uh, all of humanity, not just humanity, all of creation looks on. And there's this, uh, one, one, one point in time, we'll get to it, God, uh, all of, of creation will, will give glory to God for what's going on. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There'll come a time when, willingly or unwillingly, no one will be able to refuse the fact that this is just amazing what has happened, that Jesus Christ is indeed Lord. But if, if you could just but hear God speak to you tonight, you would understand, yes, the glory that is due to God. Why? Because he's done such an amazing thing here. He has done such a, an unbelievably tremendous thing. He's given his only begotten son. He sent his son into the world. It's this next stage of fulfillment of this plan of redemption, this plan of salvation, to which a third of the heavenly host have lost. They have nothing to which the other two thirds are looking on in wonder and amazement, to which we are recipients of. Do you not feel a sense of awe at the fact that little old you has been thought of by this God who inhabits eternity? And not only thought of, but this you little old you has been given this inheritance. You know, uh, can you imagine a will being read out and uh, uh, there's a relative you've never really, you know, paid much attention to, but they think of you and they leave you something. 
because they thought of you. And you feel like you've been thought of. You feel loved. And, not only, and the fact then that they leave you something is lovely. Friend, God himself has thought of each and every one of us. It tells us when Jesus was on the cross, he who for the joy that was set before him enjoyed the, endured the cross, not enjoyed the cross, endured the cross. But for, the, for, he who was, for the joy that was set before him. In other words, God delights in sending his son into this world. He delights to give this gift. He isn't like someone who gives a gift and then thinks because they feel duty bound to. You know somebody gives you a big gift, so you think, oh, I best give them something back. And you're seeing it and you're thinking, I really could do to eat those biscuits myself, but I, well, there's nothing else to give, so I best give you those things. Uh, a slightly unwilling giver. There's nothing of that with God. God didn't need to give anything. God could have left us be. But God has chosen freely to give this indescribable gift. That's why Paul says elsewhere, he says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. This gift is just incredible. And the angel's song is saying, basically, listen, glory to God in the highest. You, friends, you have, you don't know what you've got. You do not realize just what you've got. And I think the Christians here can testify to the truth that uh, we heard this morning, didn't we, the, the preachers who look at the, the nativity uh, year after year after year, find that they're only dipping their toe in it, and that is thrilling, and there's more, and there's more, and there's more, absolutely. Christians can testify to the fact that as they learn more of God, as they learn more about themselves and what they've been saved from, as they learn more and more through experience how much God loves them, you know, you think, wow, I didn't know the half of it before. I'm learning, I'm learning, I'm learning. And that's the experience of the Christian, always learning at just how wonderful God's love is towards, towards us. And so the angels are saying this. That's the, that's the message, if you will, of what the angels are saying. There's this great and glorious gospel that brings glory to God and it brings this supreme benefit to people of peace with God, of reconciliation with God. Uh, and it's purely God's favour. It's purely God's generosity. I mean, these words don't do it justice, do they? But the point is this. The angels are trying to sing about it. They're exploding with singing. So what are they singing? They're singing of God, of his redemption, and uh, they're exploding with praise. Uh, they're singing, this points to their experience of God. You know, they've seen God every day of their existence. And what do they say? Glory to God in the highest. That counts for something, doesn't it? This God is to be trusted. Satan whispers and says, did God really say that to Adam? And Adam and Eve listen to Satan. Satan would choose to try and do these half-truths. These angels who have experienced God every day of their lives, what do they say? Glory to God in the highest. They are absolutely 100% committed to the God they serve. They are absolutely 100% committed. And the reality is, friends, that the God of the Bible is to be trusted. In this day and age of things that can't be trusted, and it's always been the same, it just shows itself in different ways, but the God of the Bible is and must be trusted. The message of the Bible, the message of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is to be believed. Why? Because it can be trusted. Why? Because it's true. And so uh, they're, they're singing. Uh, that's what they're singing about. Um, why? Why are they singing? Uh, well, because they can't not sing. Okay? That's the reality. They can't not sing. It's impossible for them to keep a lid on it. You know, I almost get the impression, and it's don't, don't take me literally at this, but, uh, you know, a chief angel, once they've sung the song, they've got a verse in, and then the one who's chief on the rotor or something for that, for that night's uh, shift says, hey, get back to work, and they go back into to heaven. It's nonsense, isn't it, in one sense? But the point I'm making is, they, they want so much, they would willingly sneak out, <laughs> you know? Don't, don't quite, I'm not being heretical here, but the point is, they, would, they, would, they, they cannot not sing their praises. They are just, they must sing the praises, okay? Because it's, it's kind of bursting out of them. Why? Because of the whole situation. This is God. Look at what he's doing. Mankind, look up. You know, I get the impression that if they could have done, they would have gone knocking on other houses. They wouldn't have needed to knock. They would have just gone around the whole world singing, singing, singing until everybody was up. Because this message must be heard because this gospel is just unlike anything else. And that, friends, is the reality of the gospel. There is no other 
name given amongst men under heaven whereby we must be saved. This message of salvation, uh, Paul said, I, 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 I preach I, 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 nothing but Christ and him crucified. The reality is, friends, that this good news is the only good news, ultimately, that we have in this world. Because it's a talking about our eternity. It's talking about our relationship with our maker. It's talking about our salvation. It's talking about our rescue from an everlasting destruction. And our salvation to an everlasting life. It's talking about peace with God. It's talking about being an inheritor of eternal life. It's talking about being a child of God. Where once we were children of the evil one. Those who have fallen like, they are, like the angels. The third of angels. We've fallen too. But for us there's a plan of redemption. For them there's not. For us, there's a plan of redemption. And redemption, not just uh, to a position of okay, but more blessings now than even Adam and Eve lost. Because a a security, a peace, an eternal peace with God, so that when we are with him in heaven, or on that new heavens heavens and new earth, when we are uh, glorified, we will not be able to sin. We will be in God's presence. We will be able to stand and bear the holiness of God because we will be made perfect. There will be no presence of sin in us. We will be free from the penalty power and pollution of sin. And there will be no presence of sin in us. So, you know, there is no better song. There is no better message. There is no better news in all of the world. I mean, just think of it for a moment. If we could, this truth to powerfully uh, hit us as it's powerfully hit those angels, we have the truth. Just think of that now. Because imagine all those great minds, all the Einsteins, all the Galileos, uh, all, all the uh, other scientists that are boffins, all the other Nobel Peace, uh, peace uh, winners, all the, the governments, all the rich techie people, all of uh, the sportsmen, all of the people with, uh, with their own opinions and all of that. So what? It's nothing. Nations rise and fall. There is a drop in the bucket to God. It says nothing compared to this. This message, this gospel, this good news is the good news for all of humanity. And if we don't respond to it, Houston, we do have a problem. In other words, never mind what's going on in our life. Never mind what's going on in our history. Never mind what generation we're in. Never mind what, na- what nation we belong to. Never mind what our interests or our family or our life. Everything stops. It's this news stops the traffic. This news stops the world spinning. I almost have a thought that maybe one day when we see God and what he did, that the world will have stopped. Because God can do it. In other words, everything stops for this And that's kind of what the angels are wanting to say. And this is surely the experience of the Christian. Our world was turned upside down. I once was dead spiritually. But now I'm alive spiritually. I once was blind. Now I can see. I once was in darkness, but now I'm in the light of the world. I once was an enemy of God, but now God's spirit reigns and lives within me. I once was at enmity with God. Now I love him. I once was in chains to sin. Now I don't need to sin. I still do sin at times because the salvation hasn't been fully wrought out. But I am delivered from the dominion of sin. I have been placed on the rock. I am in the kingdom of God. I am under new management. I am under new ownership. I I serve King Jesus. There is nothing else that that compares. What else is that compares with such revolutionary news as this? There is nothing Because this is, we're talking now about eternal things, not things that are seen, things that are unseen, not things that are temporary, things that are eternal. And this is true of the Christian. And so the Christian's response must be surely to sing about it, to shout about it, to declare it, to witness to it. You know, there's a lesson here, I think, because in this day and age, we're in what we call a tolerant society. I mean, there's a little irony because never we've been so intolerant, really. But nevertheless, and we're in a a nation, certainly, where we've got uh, noise pollution and uh, we're we're mindful of not, you know, waking the neighbours up and things like that and uh, and, uh, being a nuisance and and, and all the rest of it. Uh, We're we're aware of the fact that um, 
uh, uh, everybody's kind of a bit stressed and a bit highly strung. This is just the generation that we're in and uh, mental health issues and all the rest of it. And these things are real and, and all the rest of it. Uh, but the temptation then is to kind of almost hunker down and just kind of keep quiet or just kind of uh, watch our P's and Q's or just make sure that we're not too offensive to anybody, uh, you know, and not to kind of offend and all the rest of it. And there's a measure to which, fine. But the point is this. These angels didn't give two hoots about what anybody else was thinking. These angels, they weren't being offensive at all, but these angels just had to sing. They had to shout. They had to give their song. Be why? Because they had something to shout about. And I think the point is this, is if we realise just what this message means for all of humanity, if we realise just what is in front of us, Christians now, if we realise just what this good news is, that this is dynamite in our hands, that this is gold in our hands, that this is precious, this is the elixir of life, this is the holy grail, this is whatever else people want to try and find and spend their lives looking for. This is it. Everything else fades into uh, insignificance. If we know we've got it, we must share about it. We must tell others, just as the shepherds did later on. I just think we've got the angels here to give us a good example because they did it communally. They did it corporately. It didn't take a long time, but they were bursting forth. You know, there is a sense in which when people see Christians believing this themselves and, as it were, just being... Uh, and we do believe it, don't we? But there's times when truths, the truths of the gospel powerfully affect us. We may have been a Christian 10 years, but then God speaks to us and we're powerfully affected by the truths, and these eternal truths just become so, so very much more real than ever they have done. And that's God at work, isn't it? And when God is at work, and God powerfully affects us, and we are just amazed afresh with the freshness of this. You know, in this day and age, where there's lots of people making a noise about not a very lot, there's a lot of people's opinions, when actually... We don't really want to hear people's uneducated opinions or ill-informed opinions where everybody's got a lot to say about not a lot. This is something where actually we should stop the traffic for and not be ashamed of it because this is something that actually will impact and is the truth and does matter and is worthy of being heard. So the angels, why have they come? Why are they singing it? Because they've got to. They've got to sing this. They've got to say amen to the message. And, you know, the privilege of being a Christian is that we can say amen to this message. We can, uh, we can declare, whether it's together corporately in song, whether it's individually to our neighbours, we have something to share. We have something to declare. We have something to tell other people about. And we're not to be ashamed of it. Paul says, didn't he, I am not ashamed of this gospel. And uh, I just challenge you, I challenge myself, in this temperature of society, where it's not so much outward persecution that Christians face, not compared to other societies, not at all, but there is a kind of gradual straitjacketing, and we're not swaying into politics, we don't need to. What we're saying is, there's this gradual almost homogenising of society, you know, you used to get the milk and then you get the cream at the top. You don't get that anymore because milk's homogenized. It's all whirled at a terrific temp, uh, uh, speed and it's all kind of just one. Okay, fine. But that doesn't do for society. And we're not to be homogenized. We are, if you will, the cream of society in as much as we have this good news. And we are to be separate. We are to be clear and distinct. And we are to say this news and it is distinct from anything else. That is there. And if somebody says, oh yes, I've got, we're to declare it in such a way, with such fervour, with such uh, enthusiasm, with such desire, that actually by pointing that straight stick, everything else will show itself to be crooked. This alone is the truth. Nothing else compares. There's nothing else that comes even close. If I preach another gospel, let me be accursed. If an angel preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. This alone is the gospel that God has made a way of reconciliation for sinful man. There's a, um, there's a way back to sin from the dark, there's a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. 
There's a door that is open and you may go in. They may go in. We all may go in. At Calvary's cross is where you begin when you come as a sinner to Jesus. Have you experienced this for yourself? Have you got that same song? Do you know that you are so precious in God's sight? Have you received the gift of salvation? Can you say, yes, I've come to Jesus, and yes, I am his, and he is mine? And if you can say yes to that, what of this song? Is this song in your heart? Have you sung it recently, or have you got laryngitis? Is this something that you want to share? And if not, why not? Because this is the best news. There's nothing else. There's nothing else, really, that we want to take our time up with. This must be, as it were, the one thing, this one thing is needful, that we tell people this good news in our own way, in the right time, not, in the, not like a bull in a china shop, not in the arm of flesh, but by God's grace, just with authenticity. Why? Because we're bubbling over like the angels. We must tell this song. We must tell people. We must wake them up if needs be, because they must hear this. This is just tremendous. And maybe it is that as we go about our daily business, we'll see the people to whom we've witnessed, like the shepherds, going and seeking Jesus. You know, maybe we've stopped believing, but you know, I do believe that if someone, God uses someone to witness to another person, that that person can be saved. I spoke to someone tonight, and there was a, a third party who they were talking about, and they said, ah, oh, I know him. He brought me to Jesus. And I was talking, I had good fellowship with a fella who had been brought to Jesus through this other fellow's witness. And I thought, that's brilliant. That's great. Do we believe that we ourselves can be used? How so? Like this, like the angels, bubbling over. We can't fake it. We can't try and drum it up. It's the reality of seeing this God at work. Why were those angels bubbling over? Because they saw God at work. They saw God's salvation plan being wrought out. They saw what was going on, and they were thrilled with it. They couldn't not sing it. How can we bubble over? We have our eyes fixed on Jesus. We have our hearts fixed on God. We lift up our hearts in praise to him. We're thrilled and enthralled afresh. God meets with us. We draw near to him. That's the promise that was pleaded at the start of this service. We draw near to him. He draws near to us and he enlivens us. The love of God is shed abroad in our heart again. We're filled afresh with the Holy Spirit. This, the truths of God, the eternal truths, hit us powerfully and all of a sudden we see it as clear as day, as fresh as a daisy, that this is the message that must be heard. Friends, when that happens in your life, you try not saying it to your spouse or to your work colleague. or to It'll be impossible to not share. And maybe you will be privileged to see, like the shepherds, people going straight then and looking for Jesus. The angels have so much to teach us, haven't they? And yet, you know, our song, we, he died for me. They can't sing that. He died for me. Why, oh, love, Lord, why, oh Lord, Lord, such love to me? Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. Amen. 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 Let's sing um, to finish. Hark the herald angels sing. <laughs>